Hello and welcome to the second part of the Behaviour Tree series tutorial. So this is a series where I am adding in support to the AI Behaviours package for uh, GOP system having actions that are based on behaviour trees, as well as supporting having standalone behaviour trees. So this series is going to run for several videos and there's a lot of bits that we need to put together for this till we get to a point where everything is fully functional. So if you are wanting to jump ahead, that's something that's very doable. So in the description below, you'll find three links. Uh, the first is to the code as it is at this point in time in the video. Uh, so if you're wanting to follow along, you can get that version of the code and just jump in directly at that point. Uh, the second link is to the code as it is at the end of this video. And the final link is to the full package. So all of the code that's being put together in this series is actually already there and up uh, available to you. So if you're wanting to just dive in and actually use the uh, full package there for it, you can do that right now. Uh, so, but if you're wanting to sort of walk through the different stages of it, then these tutorials will cover that for you. So let's dive on in. So last time we got stuff set up for, we finished with getting our base node sort of set up. Uh, so this was one of the big things that we got up and running. So what we're going to look at this time is getting things like our flow nodes happening. So our sequence, our selector and our parallel. Uh, and also have a bit of a look at the action side of things also. Okay, so this was our base node that we set up last time. So what we're going to be doing is setting up a couple of folders here. So we're going to have our flow related nodes. So these are ones that are can have children and that are controlling those behaviors. Uh, and we'll also eventually set up for action based ones as well. So in terms of our flow nodes, there obviously we need to have a base flow node class because there is some common logic to how they actually work. So I'm going to have a BT flow node base. Then we want to set up our two standard ones that are you know, any behavior tree should support. So we want to have a flow node for a selector, and then a flow node for a sequence. And I'll explain the difference between the two in a moment. So we have flow node sequence. So the idea behind these two is they work in sort of similar but subtly different ways that are actually really quite important. So a sequence is perfect when you have a chain of things that needs to happen. Uh, for example, if you wanted to have an AI go to a resource, pick up that resource, take that resource to somewhere else and put it down. You've got a chain of things and it should only continue to the next link in the chain if the previous one was successful. If any of them fails, then the entire thing should fail out. That's what a sequence node is. A selector is how you handle having fallback behaviors. So what will happen with a selector is if a node fails, or let's say one child fails, then it will try the next, and it will try the next, and it will keep doing that until one of them succeeds. So it doesn't progress to a, a net, the next child if one actually succeeded. So that's a good way of having essentially a set of priorities for things. So you, if you have a selector and then under it, you know, you might have resource gathering as the first thing that it tries to do. So as long as it can satisfy that, it will do that resource gathering. But then you might want to give it a fallback one that's just wandering or idle or other things like of that. So it's a way of being able to have fallback logic that can run. So those two are really important. The final one, though, that is also really important to have is a parallel node. Because it's really handy at times to be able to have logic that actually is running in parallel. 
So we're going to set up a parallel node that will uh, be able to support a primary and a secondary uh, sort of trees descending off of it. So those are the ones we're going to get set up first. So let's dive on in and take a look at these. So we'll begin with our flow node base. So our flow node base that inherits from our node base, but it also, we need to make sure that it implements flow node. That's a good starting point. And what we can do is tell it to implement the particular things that, for the different interfaces, everything like of that. And then we can start to populate the logic here for what these actually need to do. One thing I will do though is mark this class as abstract because it should be. It's not one that we want to ever directly instantiate. It wouldn't make sense to directly instantiate it. So what we're going to then do for that base one is we're going to get rid of these properties uh, because we want to force the child classes of this to have to actually implement those. Uh, the same is true for things like our add child. So that's one where we're going to make that abstract. Because that has to be implemented uh, by the child class. Uh, get a numerator also needs to be. So both of those stay as abstract. Our ticking of the node logic is actually fine to stay here because we don't actually need it to do anything. We just return true for the moment. So we can't do the same thing for add child and get a numerator because those are interfaces. Uh, so those still need to be there as abstract like that. Uh, there is a couple of things that we do want to specifically override though. So I know logic like that is all fine, but we want to override the reset behavior. So our reset one, now we haven't been able to access that. If we take a look at where we've got reset here, that is, there as being public, uh, we haven't made that virtual. So we're going to make that virtual so that we can override reset. And what we should find now is that reset appears properly there, adds in the base. So we're going to check, okay, well, if it has children, and then what we want to do is we need to tell those children to reset. Because when you reset a node, that needs to uh, essentially ripple down to all of the descendant nodes. So we want to make sure that that gets passed on. Actually, we do child in this. So because we, for the flow node, it implements uh, that particular interface. If we remember, we go and take a look at that. It implements I enumerable. Uh, that's what allows us to essentially do a for each over it which is really handy. So what we would do is we would just say child reset Now we'll notice that's actually not showing up as something that is accessible there in the node. So we haven't told it the particular type here and this is one where it's actually a bit tricky for it to figure out the type so we want to be explicit that it is an ibe node uh, so that's good that means reset is going to get replicated through the other thing that we want to then override is the gathering of the debug data now, if you remember from last time, what we did was with our debug data, uh, we were showing, okay, here's the particular you know, details of the services, things like of that. So that was sort of what we were uh, indicating there. With it. What we 
need to be able to do though is then put the data in for any of the children. So that's something where, okay, we can see how that will look. And again, this is something we might find that we need to modify it uh, when we get to the actual testing of it. So we want to override that protected. We override this one. Now we can run the base, that's fine. What we want to specifically do though is check and see, okay, is this uh, node selected? Because if it is, we want to actually be able to indicate some details. So what we want to do is we want to actually uh, output the data for the children. So we only want to do that if it is actually selected. So what I would do is, okay, well, we push the indent. And just to make sure it's properly covered, we do the pop there. And then what I would do is same process that we did before. And then we just go, okay, well, child, gather debug data, like that. So we'll hook up the debugging interface. There is stuff we want to output kind of for this particular node though. Uh, it would be good to be able to indicate for you know this node what its actual sort of status is and display the details of it. So what I am going to do is I am going to check here if and we grab in is selected. So we only want to output this if it's actually selected. So easiest way to set this up because I want to have different prefixes and suffixes appended to this. So I'm going to prefix. So check if the last status is that it is in progress, then I actually want to bold it so that we highlight uh, that this node is actually active. So that's good. And we do the same thing for the suffix. Except the closing for the bolding. Then our debugger, we go and we add a new text line. A text line. We provide our prefix. We say that it's a flow node, a debug display name, and then we include the suffix. Just gives us a handy way of indicating, okay, is this node actually actively running and doing something at the moment? So that's pretty solid for the base of this. Now we can start to implement the actual specifics for some of these ones. Uh, and we're going to start with the sequence one, because the sequence one is pretty basic, to be honest. Uh, it doesn't need to do particularly much. So, okay, let it implement everything. Well, okay, a bunch of these are pretty straightforward. For starters, this needs to keep track of a list of children. So it's going to have a list of IBT node children. And I am going to new that. Then what I will do is it has children. If children is not equal to null. And if children dot count is greater than zero. That just makes sure that we know it actually has children. We're gonna have our get and our protected set here. Uh, the reason I keep the protected set there is because I wanna support being able to customize the display name at times. Because it's always handy to be able to you know, change that, make it easier for debugging. Uh, one of the things I do want to keep track of 
is the last child. Because that's going to, by keeping track of that, that actually makes our life a little bit easier for being able to work with a few things. So just sort of keeps it keeps it a little bit simpler. I need to set up my constructor for this. So I have my flow node sequence. Now that all it needs to take in optionally is a display name. So it doesn't need to do anything beyond that. And we just check, okay, well, if that string is valid, then our debug display name is that. So nothing complex that we need to do for the actual uh, constructor setup there. That looks good. In terms of uh, getting the enumerator, so for the sequence and for the selector, this part's actually really easy because what we can do is we don't need to do any custom logic. We can just actually return the enumerator for that list of children itself. That makes life a lot easier for us. Saves us having to wrangle dealing with uh, you know, tracking the enumerator, what thing we're accessing ourselves. So, okay, when we're adding a child, well, that in node, we want to make sure we set the owning tree to the owner. So that's good. We've got that configured. We add that child in. We make sure we store what the last child is. And then what we would do is we return that node that was actually created. So that's good. Now we don't have any interfaces for removing or reordering children. Uh, if we did, we would need to make sure that we are properly updating that last child there so that it is always correct. So that's good so far. Then our on tick for the children. So what I want to keep track of firstly is did we tick any nodes? And I'm going to by default assume that we didn't. And that's actually going to correspond to what I return, whether we did successfully tick anything. Then I'm going to loop over all of our children, child and children. And actually we'll be specific that this is an IBT node. So, okay. If a node has already been completed, we want to actually skip it. So with sequences, we don't run a node if it's already saying that it's succeeded. So if the child's last status is succeeded, then we skip it. So we skip if already completed. If that's the case, then what we do is then our last status well, we take that child and we tell it to tick, providing our delta time. So everywhere throughout this, I'm using a passed in time rather than time.delta time. The reason is, is that this means that the entire AI system, we could tick it at a faster or a slower rate very, very easily. That's the whole reason for this. So that's good. We've ticked it. That means we can actually set this to true because we did successfully tick something. Let's zoom in a little bit more. Now, if this child failed, we are actually fully done. So if the child failed to tick, then we need to actually exit. So if the last status is equal to and uh, failed, then what we do is we just immediately break. Now I don't want to do that for if it's succeeded, because if we have succeeded, we might not actually be done. Because if the last status was succeeded, but we weren't the last child, and this is why we kept track of what was the last child. So if we succeeded and the child is not the last child, then actually our last status 
should be in progress and we should exit. So if the child succeeded but is not the last, then we switch back to being in progress. A sequence only reports as succeeded if all of the children within it have succeeded. So that's good. Then I want to check, okay, if the last status was uh, succeeded or if the last status was in progress. In other words, if things have essentially gone correctly. Uh, now it's probably a little bit unnecessary to specifically check both of these because we've already handled everything there, but just to be safe, if it was succeeded or it's in progress, then we can break immediately. If the child succeeded or is in progress, then we are done. And for our sequence node, that's actually it. There's nothing further that it needs there for it. So now we can get our selector set up. Okay, so we've got the sequence set up. Now the selector is similar and a lot of the logic is going to be uh, quite similar to it. But there are actually a couple of bits that are different in pretty important ways. So this is based off of our flow node. We will let it implement everything. Now, a lot of this is going to be identical to what we actually did uh, for the other one. So we do have the same logic of keeping track of the last child, all of those things. So quite a bit of this is just going to be the same. So I'm actually going to bring uh, this over because it's not really any different. And even down to things like our you know, enumerator, adding of the children, uh, those are actually completely identical. They work the exact same way. And that's something where you, know, you potentially could have one inherit off of the other. Uh, the reason you know, I sort of haven't is I usually look for having three similar use cases uh, before I do something like of that. And there really isn't that because the parallel node does actually work quite differently. So our adding of the child, the enumerator, that works very similarly. Our debug logic actually also works the same way. Uh, so we don't need to do anything custom there. So we do need our constructor. Again, because it's the same, I'm just going to bring it over and rename it. So that's our flow node selector. Now, the tick is actually the part where things are different and they're different in a very important but subtle way, and it's an easy to miss way. So what I'm going to do is, okay, we keep track, did we tick any nodes? So, so far, no different. We return that value. That side's the same. We loop through. In this case, child in children. So we do that. So that's exactly the same. Now in the sequence one, what we did was we would check if it was succeeded. And if it was succeeded, then we would uh, just continue. Now with the selector, you could easily think, okay, well, it's the exact same thing, except it skips it if it failed. But that's not entirely correct because what should happen is if it failed it should go back and actually check 
have any of the earlier ones failed because a decorator has locked them out and a decorator is now not locking them out. Because in that case, we should actually restart the sequence. So what I'm going to do is, okay, f the child's last status is failed. So because it's potentially failed, I want to check, okay, do the decorators now permit this running? So f, do the decorators now permit running? And we provide the delta time. So if that is not the case, then it's actually fine to skip this child. So did this child fail previously? And are they now able to run solely due to decorators changing? Because if we remember that node base, if we go to the do decorators now permit running, if the decorators previously were not the reason that it was prevented from running, that will actually fail out. So it's only going to get through here if the decorators previously didn't allow it and now do. So if that's the case, then what we want to do is we actually need to do a reset for this node and any of its siblings that come after it. So what I'm going to do is, okay, reset this node and siblings. So we want to check, okay, can we reset firstly? By default, we can't. And then we loop through IBT node other child in children. Now, if other child is equal to this one, then can reset becomes true. And what we do is we check, okay, if I can reset, then I can do other child dot reset. So what this means is that we will lock out being able to do any resetting as soon as we have encountered the node that matches ourselves, we allow resetting. And then for all of the ones further down the chain in that, it will perform that reset. So that's good. That will handle that logic. So, okay. A lot of the rest is actually pretty similar then. We still go and the last status is we do a child tick and our delta time like that. We set that we have tick nodes. Now our logic here ends up being a little bit different to what we did with a sequence. So what we want to check is, okay, well, if the last status is a failure, and child is not equal to last child, then our last status goes back to being in progress. So similar, but subtly different to the sequence one. So if this node failed, and it isn't the last child, then we actually go back to being in progress. Otherwise, what we're wanting to check is, okay, if that node has succeeded or is in progress, then we're done. So if the last status equal to in progress. Uh, now with this, I want to cover if it was in progress or if it succeeded. Those are our exit conditions essentially.
So if it was in progress or succeeded, then we're done. And that's it for the selector. So slight differences with handling logic there for decorators. We don't do this for a sequence because with a sequence, it's essentially an ordered set of tasks. Whereas with the selector, it's actually more a prioritized set of things we're trying to do. So if one of those higher priority ones suddenly changes to being available, we want to be able to interrupt. So this is essentially allowing interrupting. We could make that as an optional thing, uh, but for now, that's something that we just have as a, a default that it's able to interrupt. So that looks good so far. Now we get to the parallel node. So the parallel node is one that works quite a bit differently. Uh, it's still not super intricate, but it is a little bit different in terms of how it actually works. So, okay, our parallel node. We'll follow the same logic we did with our other ones. So it comes off of flow node base. We'll implement the default setup here. Now the things that are different with this is okay it's debug display name obviously we will update that and default that to parallel we're not going to have a list of children though what we are going to have instead is a protected ibt node primary tree and a secondary tree so we have children if one of these, and in particular, we actually want to require the primary tree has to not be null. Primary tree is the thing that will drive the status of this node. It will drive how long this node keeps running for as a result. So whether it has children or not is only going to be determined by whether it has a primary tree. So that's good. We want to have similar logic with the constructor. So our flow node parallel, our usual defaults here in terms of, okay, that optional display name, and then being able to check okay, that's our usual logic. Now, adding a child to this actually is not something that we want to support. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw not a not implemented exception, but a invalid operation exception, because this what we're trying to do is not valid. So I'm just going to output the details of who this is. So parallel bt nodes do not support add child use set primary or set secondary so we make sure it's nice and clear in the uh, error of exactly how to fix it so add child we don't want to do uh, anything there with that now ticking logic I'm going to implement the enumerator. I actually won't implement just yet because that actually is the part that is a little bit more involved. So what we would do is, okay, if the primary tree has finished, then we just return false because we've done nothing and we actually can't do anything. Otherwise, the last status is the primary tree and we tick so make sure we give our in delta time like that. So, okay, that's good. Now, if we have a secondary tree, then we should actually make sure that we tick that. But there's a couple of sort of caveats there. So, okay, if the secondary tree is not equal to null, and what we want to check is, okay, did it fail? because the secondary tree, we shouldn't really run it if the primary one has actually failed during its tick. So if the last status is not equal to and our failed result. So 
if we've got a secondary tree and it's not failed, if that secondary tree has finished, we're actually going to reset it so that it actually keeps running. Because the idea of generally behind the primary secondary setup here is the secondary one is kind of a looping bit of logic that we keep running in the background. Uh, otherwise, we do secondary tree tick and our delta time. We don't do anything with the status from the secondary tree because it's not what drives the status of this node. Uh, and then we return true because we have successfully ticked the children. So that looks good. That's the general logic that we need there for this. Uh, we want to set up our functions for set primary. And this takes in just a node. So we need to make sure that that node, we set the owning tree. So we need to make sure that properly gets uh, done. And then we set the node like of that. So that's good. And unsurprisingly, set secondary is going to follow a very similar process. Get our node in. We make sure we set the owning tree on it. And then our secondary tree just gets set. So we only support having one node under it. That node could be a flow node and uh, or you know a sequence or a selector or even other parallel ones. That's completely fine. We just want to keep things a little bit simpler for ourselves of keeping track of okay, is it the primary or the secondary one? So now the thing that we've got left that we haven't sorted is this enumerator. So this is where we're actually going to implement our own enumerator for this. So we're going to have a public class. And this is our BT flow node and parallel enumerator that implements I enumerator like that. Now, for this to work, this needs to keep track of a couple of things. So it needs the primary tree. It needs the secondary tree. We keep track of an index. Even though we've only got two things, kind of works handy having an index there because we can keep track of, okay, if it's not valid. This gets a constructor as well. So it has parallel enumerator. Now what this gets given is our primary tree and our secondary tree. Just like that. And the setup there is not surprising. So what we do is, okay, we have a public bool move next, and these are all parts of the interface. So what we would do with this is, okay, we plus plus the index and we return if index is less than two. Essentially, we're returning indicating if the index is valid. Uh, so zero or one are valid indices, but a two, it would not be. And we only need to check because we're incrementing, we only need to check that it has to be less than in this case. Uh, it does have a reset function, which what reset does is it sets the index back to minus one. We need to have a object i enumerator dot current. So what that does is that returns, that's actually a uh, property. So it needs to get and that returns current, like that, just current. And we will see in a moment, what we then do is we also have a public IBT node current that also has a getter. And if 
the index is zero, we return primary tree. Otherwise, if the index is one, we return the secondary tree. And otherwise, we are going to throw a new system invalid operation exception. So we just provide a basic one there because we're trying to you know, essentially access something that's not valid. So that's good. We only need to support the move next operation. So that gives us our enumerator, but how do we actually use it? And that's actually pretty straightforward because we have our get enumerator function here. So what we do is we return a new BT flow node parallel enumerator, primary tree, secondary tree. And that's actually all it needs. So it gives us our parallel node, our sequence node, and our selector. We'll go back and make sure we don't have any errors, which we don't, so that's good. So we've got our different ones of those up and running. So what we're going to do, just to complete the set of base nodes that we need to have up and running, we're going to get our action node base set up. So this is one that is going to be needed by a lot of particular things. And having seen the flow nodes, it's kind of good to see what this actually needs to do. Uh, so it does implement node base, but it also implements our action node. Uh, and this is abstract as well. So we don't need to implement everything for this. Uh, so a couple of things that we do want to implement though, one of the big ones is that has children. So rather than turning true or throwing an exception, this actually just maps directly to false because that's just exactly what it needs to do. Our overrides here, so we have our protected override so one of the ones was ticking the children. Well, we actually don't have any children to tick. So we're just going to return false. So there's nothing for it to do. So that's the big difference between action and flow nodes. Flow nodes can have children. Action nodes very specifically cannot. So that's good. The other thing I'm going to set up in here then is we have our gathering of the debug data. So we have that. Now we do want to have some similar logic to this, that idea of being able to indicate uh, what stuff is active and not. That's actually really useful. And actually it's going to look pretty much exactly like this. So we can bring this over because if we look at the logic, it's pretty much identical. We want to display the status for whether you know we're running in progress, things like that, and then we want to allow uh, you know, the base logic to run. Again, this is stuff where we may reformat and restructure this uh, when we get to testing it with the actual debugger, but this gives us sort of a starting point. The other thing I'm going to set up here is a little bit of a helper. So I want to have a helper for returning things. So our return helper. Uh, so this takes in a result. And I also want to take in our, you know, being able to essentially override the return value. So this is just something that I want to be able to use in tick to manage that status. So idea is it would set the status to in result. And then what it would do is if we have a value for that, then I'm just going to return that. Otherwise, what I would do is I return based upon if the result was not equal to failed. This will just make it a little bit cleaner and easier for uh, working with these sort of statuses and everything. 
So that's good. I might actually change that to set status. Calculate return. Bit verbose, but makes it a bit more clear what it's actually doing there. So that's good. That's going to give us our basis there for when we set up the different actions. Uh, the other things then that want to sort of look at setting up is we've got our base decorator. Before we dive into all of the actions, because there is quite a bit to that, I want to set up a few other decorators here. So I'm going to create a script for a decorator that functions as a cooldown. So the idea is, is that it can lock a node running for a time, or lock a node out of running for a time. Uh, I want a generic decorator that just actually runs a function is going to be really handy. And for our navigation side of things, we're going to set up two ones, a decorator for checking if we are moving, and a decorator for checking if we have finished moving. So it gives us a bunch of extra decorators, but this is going to uh, give us a good set of decorators up and running from this, uh, which will be really handy. We don't need things like our selector and that anymore. We're done with those. So now we're on to just getting our decorators going. So, okay, let's get a few of these set up. Let's start with our one for uh, checking if we have finished moving. So this is going to be a decorator base. It's a concrete class, so no abstract or anything. So we can let it implement everything. Uh, this does not post-process the results. Uh, it is going to have a default name that we set on it though. Figured. Uh, so its default one will just be move finished, like that. On evaluate, it's actually really straightforward because what we need to do is return our owning tree and we can access the navigation interface and we can say, have we reached the destination? So really simple for the evaluation. Uh, we set up a constructor for it as well. Now, a couple of things that we want to actually have come into this. So if we take a look at our base decorator, just for where we were setting things up. So we did have support for that uh, is inverted. And we just want to try and make sure we're consistent. So having in is inverted, uh, and the display name last is a thing we just want to make sure that we do. So to make sure I match that, I'm going to actually copy that. So I want to not mess that up. Uh, so for checking if it's finished moving, there is no parameters that come in. So it is just those default ones. We pass the in is inverted to the base. And then we check, okay, well, if our display name, not null or empty, then we can just set that debug display name like that. That's it for the finished moving decorator. So our decorators generally should be pretty uh, straightforward, pretty minimal. Our is moving, it's going to be really similar. And so similar that I am going to just duplicate this because there is no point reinventing the wheel, especially in a case like this when even zoomed in, it actually still all fits on the screen. So this one is saying, is it moving? We need to rename, obviously, just to make sure we don't miss that. Uh, and then it is actually asking for different information here, but it's asking for if it's pathfinding or moving. 
So this is just giving us all of those little bits and pieces in terms of, you know, the decorators and things like of that that we'll need for putting together the behaviors trees later. So this is just giving us those sort of little building blocks. It's very similar to uh, if we were with the state machine one, building up the states and transitions first before actually the actions that make use of them. That's kind of what we're doing here is we're building those foundational little pieces that everything will make use of. So that's good. Our function one comes next. Uh, now this one will actually have a parameter to it. So I am gonna grab those just so I make sure I don't forget. So we have our decorator base. Let it implement the default setup. Oops. Uh, now, as always, for these ones, uh, the function does not post process the tick result. Uh, the default with the debug display name, we're just going to configure an initial one. Uh, it's just going to be run function. Now it's constructor I do want to set up immediately. So we've got our decorator function and we just want to be able to pass in a system.func. I want to be able to give it the delta time because that is something that we are providing. And I do want to get a return value back from it that we can make use of. So this is our in on evaluate function. Then we just have our normal default parameters there. We run our base, provide the in is inverted. So same logic that we normally do. We check again that the string is not null or empty. What defaulted to putting in trim there uh, and actually getting the name wrong. It's weird, it'll do the autocomplete perfectly for a lot of times and then just suddenly get confused. Uh, it's quite strange. Uh, so this we want to store as a property here, a variable. Uh, so we're going to have our onEvaluate function like that. We'll just store that. And then in the onEvaluate here, well, we return on evaluate function and we just run that with the delta time. But if we don't have that set up, so if on evaluate function is equal to null, we should just return false. This just gives us an easy way to have a decorator that we can just generically hook into logic uh, in a really straightforward way. So that's actually super handy. But that's it for the on evaluate one. Uh, the cooldown one is a little bit more involved, but not by much. Uh, it doesn't need to do too much more than that. So we get this set up. So decorator base, same as the other ones. This one does actually post-process the result. It won't change it, but it needs to be able to read it. That's the important thing. So I will also have an override, uh, and this is going to be an override for that post process. Uh, I think that actually has to be, that's right, has to be public. So we do want to have that. Uh, we will just actually return the base logic there. We don't want to be modifying it. There'll be a couple of things we inject into this, but its job is to read the results, not to actually modify them. Uh, we want to keep track of, we want to have a min value. And what I'm going to do is have a nullable max value. So I don't want to force that the max value has to be provided. I want to give an option there. I'm going to, just to save typing, duplicate these because input wise when we're setting up our constructor our cooldown one 
it has to have a minimum time. So our min cooldown. Now everything else after that is optional. So we want to float put in max cooldown. That is null by default. And we have the defaults for everything else. We do our usual logic with the base. And we also do our usual logic for, okay, f string dollar empty, and then our debug display name being set, uh, which we will update this as well. The cooldown. So that's good. We'll store our different values. So our min value, our max, and that looks good. So how this is going to actually work is we need to keep track of, okay, is there a cooldown remaining? So I'm going to have a nullable float cooldown remaining. So that's going to be null by default. Then when we evaluate, what I want to do is, okay, well, if cooldown remaining is null, then we just return true because we're not currently on a cooldown. Now, if we are on a cooldown, then we need to update it. So that's the first step. If that cooldown remaining is less than or equal to zero, then we're going to actually null the cooldown remaining and we return true because again, it's able to run. So update the cooldown and test if expired. Otherwise, we return false because we know if we get to this point, we know that we have a cooldown and we know that it hasn't fully elapsed. So that's good. So we have the logic for updating the cooldown remaining, setting it to null, but then we need to actually handle enabling that cooldown. So, okay, we only want to look for enabling it. Firstly, the one of the criteria that needs to be met is cooldown remaining has to be null. Because a node, we want to make sure that we only handle sort of you know, the process of uh, setting a cooldown for it if it isn't already in the middle of one. So there must be a no cooldown currently active on it. And then what we are looking for is that the result is one of our end states, essentially. So we're looking for it being succeeded, or we're looking for it being failed. We only care about those two ones, and we need to be very careful with this with the parentheses of making sure that it requires this condition and one of these two to be true. If you miss this outer set of parentheses here, then it won't run correctly because it's going to be running you know, any time that the result is failed, which potentially can be quite a lot. Failure is a valid result uh, from behavior tree nodes. That's actually quite the reason we have a selector is because failing is actually a expected standard part of the pattern. So, okay, that's good. What I would then do is if we actually have a max value, so if max value is not null, then our cooldown remaining is a random range from min value to max value. Oops, that should be a random dot range. But otherwise, our cooldown remaining is just actually the min value. 
So it's just exactly the same. We don't change it. Uh, I might rename these min and max value to max cooldown time and min cooldown time, just to make them a little bit clearer. So min cooldown time. So that's good. That's our cooldown decorator. So what we can do is this is really handy for a scenario where, okay, we want some a particular behavior to happen. It might be even an urgent high priority for it. So it might be, you know, at the very beginning of a selector, but we might then not want it to run for an extended time because it might be something like a really heavy attacks, things like of that. So it should go on cooldown after a while. Or it might be something that's an expensive operation to do, and so we don't want to be continually thrashing it. So the idea is, is that uh, if there is no cooldown active and the node completed, then go on cooldown. Whether it's a success or a fail, it doesn't actually matter in this case, because a fail still is going to have run some logic there, so we still lock it out. Again, that's something where we could vary that behavior. We could add some nuance to this if we find it's necessary, where it only goes into cooldown on a succeeded node. But we don't necessarily need to do that. So that's a good setup. We've got, if we go back and just check and make sure nothing's grumpy at us, which it's not. So we have our all of our different flow nodes set up. We now have all of our different uh, decorators sort of set up for the basic logic here. So what we'll be getting up and running next time is things like our actual actions, the sort of core logic for being able to have our FSM actions and our you know, behavior trees there. We're getting those uh, bits of sort of core logic set up already. So as yet, we still don't have anything visible that we can see running. Uh, that is one of the things when you're building systems like of this, there is a lot of pieces that you often need to get into place uh, before it can actually be up and running. And that sort of takes you know, a lot of time with the foundation. So again, remember in the description below, there are links to this code as it was at the start of this video, the code as it is now, so there is a link to the completed package. So if you're wanting to just jump to the final code, then you're going to be able to do that by jumping to that one. So all of those are there available, so you can dive on in and experiment with that stuff. Thanks folks, hope you found the video interesting and helpful. If you have, check and like and subscribe, it really helps out, it's really appreciated. If you're looking for the code for the project, then in the description below you will find three links. The link to the code at the start of the project, the link to the code as it is now, and the link to the completed package that has everything from this video and for the future ones after this. So all of those are available. You can use that code in any of your own projects, commercial or non-commercial ones. Uh, it's completely free to be making use of there. If you have any questions, chuck those in a comment below. And if you're looking for other ways to support the channel, then I do have a Patreon, and there is a link to that in the description as well. But until next time, 